uh, the brittle cottonwoods and the sharply channeled barren buttes and how we wish you were with us out here amongst the sagebrush and the cottonwood trees and the, the bluffs of the Little Missouri River. We're glad you're with us. Let me tell you a little bit about this morning. We're going to go for a couple of hours here. Uh, we have some pre-recorded segments that we did in places where there is not adequate connectivity. Uh, they'll be played as we rush from one TR scene to the next so that we can stream live. We have some interviews with some extraordinary people here in the Badlands. And this is more casual than the last two events. So as you know, you've been uh, sending in your chat questions and they've been uh, given over to me. But today, if you have a thought, um, make sure we see you. Maybe raise your hand. There is that function on Zoom. And we will call on you. And if the technology works, you'll be able to talk to our distinguished guests or ask other questions or make comments. But, but just to say this, first of all, what an absolutely perfect day in the North Dakota Badlands. It's about 58 degrees. There's a five mile an hour breeze, I would say. The trees are turning. You couldn't ask for a more beautiful day. We get about 40 of these per annum. And when we get them, you have to, you have to seize them. We're practicing um, social distancing and, um, and pandemic protocol, but, but President Easton, I think we can pull our, our masks a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, we're so glad that you're with us. You've been a great supporter of the TR Center and the digital work that we're doing. You have roots in North Dakota. You were away for a time, you're back. Tell us about that. Uh, very, very exciting. My family, uh, both of my parents are from Western North Dakota. My mom was actually born in Mott, uh, North Dakota and my father in Beulah, uh, in Beulah, North Dakota. So uh, uh, spent early years in North Dakota and then other parts relatively nearby. Uh, but this was always home. Gram you know, grandma and grandpa on both sides were, were in Western North Dakota. And so it's, uh, it's pretty magical for me to have this position that I have, uh, that I have right now. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's really exciting for me. To be here. And did I think you said you have some roots in the coal mining world of Beulah, North yeah my my grandfather actually uh immigrated from scotland came okay. over from scotland uh had the fun experience of you know the ellis island experience of looking him up a few a couple of years ago uh and uh and he was a miner as long as as well as his brothers they came over two at a time from scotland to mine coal in Beulah. um original uh, original days in those days it was underground mining right uh, and uh, and and Grandpa, uh, among his brothers, uh, my grandpa was the mule tech uh, at, at, at the mine. So uh, it, this little little fun part of, uh, of of our family history. You're trained in the law. I, yes, and yes. you were in Wyoming for a long time. Uh, is that correct? Uh, correct. Uh, I taught at the. Uh, I was the dean for a while at the University of Wyoming College of Law, and then taught there. You know the the presidential trip out to the west coast with the john muir visit on the way back theodore roosevelt came through and spoke uh, uh spoke at the university of wyoming uh francis e warren who was mentioned in the program last Denver night was warren. there of course um and somebody said uh somebody came up with the idea knowing roosevelt's background why don't you ride the horses from Laramie down to Cheyenne, and as the, as, as the Wyoming, as we Wyoming sell this through, as I understand it, Theodore Roosevelt thought that was a capital idea, right? Well, he was, he was, he, Warren was not quite as excited about it. Warren was sort of the reluctant, uh, capable but reluctant horseman on that on that trip. So that's a considerable uh, ride. It is, it is, and it's and it's uh, and there's a little uh, area of the, the Laramie Range. It's called between. It's a, it's it's. It's not as open as this. It's a, it's a challenging ride, but it, and, you know, cl sort of classic Theodore Roosevelt. You know, of course, we're going to well, ride horses. We'll yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. Took, he, he did, that was this 1903 trip where he went 14,000 miles into 20 some states. He gave 262 speeches. That was a trip where he spent a fortnight in Yellowstone National Park. And then he went to the Grand Canyon and said, leave it as it is. Yep, yep. And yep, then he yep. went to see the Redwoods. And this was like one of the greatest presidential trips up till its time. And he made the most of it and helped. It was sort of partly a sightseeing trip. He saw the Grand Canyon for the first time. He saw many things for the first time. But then it was also sort of a campaign swing, an informal campaign swing. It helped to solidify his election in 1904. You've been the president of DSU now for how long? 
uh, a little more than nine months. And you're enjoying it, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah for, for the most part. It's a very interesting time to be president of, a, of, of an institution of higher education. But, uh, but yeah, I'm I, I, enjoying it more. You know, yeah, sure. May you live an interesting time. Exactly. So goodness, exactly. This is one of them. And so you've managed the pandemic protocols and the student numbers are good. We, our numbers are actually pretty good. We are face to face. You know, the uh, a lot of institutions aren't. The University of Wyoming is pretty right. much all uh, all online. We are we're trying really hard to stay face to face while doing a little bit of this at the same time, uh, so students can access uh, if they're in quarantine. Uh, you know, it's it's an odd thing to maybe think about, but we have students in their residence halls quarantining who are going to class via technology because uh, that'll limit the exposure keep our keep our spread down there's nowhere that's zero zero spread in the united kept states right now i mean you can't guarantee it but we're, we, we're kept it at a pretty good level congratulations let's turn to our our hero theodore roosevelt dickinson state is in a unique position because it's just 35 miles from his second home his first home is long island sagamore hill new york city but if he had a second home it was the badlands of north Dakota. they got under his skin in a huge way you can see why what's it like to, to have that burden opportunity that roosevelt is sort of your guy it is a it is just amazing uh you, you know it's not only was theodore roosevelt a president of the united states who has a direct connection to our area which is huge for a university right there but he's also one of the most interesting people certainly one of the most interesting people that ever lived in the united states and and one of the most interesting people that's lived in the history of the world in Anywhere, my view. Yeah. And so it's a, it, and, and from, a, from the standpoint of a university, there's so much to Roosevelt, right? I mean, there's the political angle, but there's the, the naturalist angle, which we're focusing, focusing on in other, in other, in other uh, symposia. Uh, you know, he, he's there at the founding of the NCAA, what became the NCAA, the, the institution to, to organize college athletics. You have to say college football. Uh, it, it, there's just it's just almost anything. Plus, he was a literary fellow. It, 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 yes, yes. You know, he's probably the readingest of all American presidents. So you, you can come at him from almost any angle, except finance. He was terrible with money himself. But <laughs> in every other way, there's something at the university that can connect with this great. And you could even you could even run the finance as the, that's the bad skiing angle, right? I mean, the uh, yeah, he made some pretty bad financial decisions in this area, but they, right here. yeah, I mean, they were, um, they were part of, I don't, I don't think he would have traded them. No, he says the best loss of money in his life. But he, but, but even that you could, you can, you can study because there was that connection to business. Uh, although, you know, he had that option. Decided to go elsewhere. They were sort of import, export people in, in glass and so on and, and banking. So, you know, he, every day he just would give me twenty dollars, and then at the end of the day she'd say, "What happened to the 20? And he'd say, "I have no idea." He just he just couldn't figure out how to manage his personal effects. But he wound up being a not a wealthy man, but a well-off man, and largely because of the books that he wrote. You know, forty books, and four of them at least are about about yes. this. Yeah. So what's your what's your plan for the university as the Roosevelt? Uh, idea gets more and more heated up in Western North Carolina. How can you make the university even more of a center? I know the digital work is yeah, yeah. Really actually, famous. we have we have some real short-term important plans. We have we have a program at the university called the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Program. Uh, we're a very small uh, 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 school. Uh, it's an unusual. It's kind of unusual for a small school to have an honors program, but we're very proud of that program. We're going to put a little boost into that program this year because we're we're going to have an open competition among our faculty serve as the director of that program for the next four years uh, and we're, we're going to basically make that the most prestigious faculty position on campus wow. uh, and that uh, uh, I think that's that's going to that's going to be really exciting uh, 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 Mayor Dennis Johnson of Dickinson and Vaughn Johnson provided the economic support wow. to make that to make that happen um, it, all kinds of I, I've got I have all kinds I got, I won't even share all of them I, I mean there's just a lot there's a lot to make plans that we're yes, working yes. on too. yeah we've got we're just about out of time for this segment but I want to ask you this question 
busy as you are, and, and coming in first nine months are hectic, plus the pandemic and everything else that's going on. How often are you able to get out here? Into this you know, I was thinking as I drove over today, I think this is uh, in those nine months, I think this is visit number seven for me. It's just, uh, uh, I, I, I like, you know, I, and I shouldn't say anything like was about how presumptuous, but I come out here and kind of recharge the battery. Uh, it's just fun to get out here. It's just such an amazing place. For those who have never been here, Little Missouri starts at Devil's Tower down in your former Wyoming. It winds along the edge of the Black Hills, touches Montana here, and then starts to cut these badlands until about 80 miles north of there's something called the Grand Canyon of the Little Missouri, and it's actually one of the most breathtaking places in the American West. You can see why this place mattered so much to our man here. It's, it's uh it's a hard, well, I don't know if it's a hard place to describe to people because when people ask me from distant places, why should I come and visit North Dakota? Of course, tell them the Badlands. And they think of the South Dakota Badlands, which are interesting in their own way. The badder Badlands. Yeah, the, the, the sort of moonscapey uh, Mars scene. Uh, what we love, by the way. Uh, yes, yeah, no, no, no. But, I, but I, uh, I tell them, and I don't know if you, if you can correct me, but I tell them it's the best way to sort of get an introduction, it's a little miniature version of the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. Very scaled down, um, which in some ways is nice because it's, it's uh, it, Sharon and I were talking earlier and it's, you can kind of absorb it a little more than, I mean, I love the Grand Canyon. Everybody loves the of course, Grand Canyon. there's only one. But, but it's, it's a little bit like that, you know, I mean, the, the rivers cut through and, and, and it, it exposes these amazing things. I, th I think this, that we have behind us today, and I'm, you know, I don't know, so I'm going to ask you. We have most of the colors we're going to see in the fall. Maybe not in the same numbers. There's a little bit of restish uh, sort of color, but this is this is pretty much our palette. This is as good as it gets out three weeks. These leaves will be gone in yeah. winter. The season of iron desolation will set in. We need to go back to uh, headquarters for a recorded segment. You and I and Sharon are going to rush off to the next scene. Excellent. More about Roosevelt and other great places than that. We're so glad you're with us today. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's very we'll exciting for the soon. day. See you again soon. a couple of hours. Why, what does this place mean and why is it important? Well, first, it's just spectacularly beautiful. This is one of the three or four of my favorite places in North Dakota, but we are actually, Sharon, in Little Cannonball Creek. You wouldn't know it, but this is Little Cannonball Creek, locally called Crick. You see a tiny little bit of water here. It would be running full for three or four days per year and not for the rest of the time. But here's why it's important. Roosevelt came to Dakota Territory in September of 1883 with one purpose in mind, and that was to kill a buffalo. He knew that the buffalo were probably going to go extinct. They didn't, thanks in part to him. And he wanted to get one before it was too late. And so he took the Northern Pacific Railroad, a five-day journey from New York out to a siding the Little Missouri River, and he stayed overnight in a ramshackle uh, hotel called the Pyramid Park. And the next day, he wandered around this little village and searched for a guide and hired one, a guy named Joe Ferris, and he said, I want to kill a buffalo. Take me to where I can get a buffalo. There weren't many buffalo left in Dakota Territory. There might have been 200 altogether, and Joe Ferris, the guide, was not at all really interested in helping this New York aristocrat on a sort of impossible mission. But he did it, and they headquartered at a little ranch, at a little ranch headquarters, not very far from here, um, operated by Lincoln and Gregor Lang, and it was on Little Cannonball Creek, and this was the site of, 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 of the great adventure. So 
you said um, he came by rail. Could have gone anywhere if he wanted to. Why did he come here? Well, within limits. So that's it's a really good question. So why here and not somewhere else? He couldn't get to the Black Hills. No railroad. The transcontinentals were through Nebraska along the Platte or through what's now North Dakota and across the Little Missouri River here. So he had to go to one of the two if he wanted to get somewhere where the railroad could take him. If there had been a railroad to the Black Hills or the Bighorn Mountains, he probably would have done that. But this is where the railroad could get him. And so he had a friend in New York who had a, a kind of uh, investment in the in what might have been a dude ranch or a hunting headquarters out in the Badlands. And they were going to travel together. But this fellow dropped out of the trip, and Roosevelt, who was 25 or 24, decided to make it alone. And he came out and he arrived in the dark in, in, um, in what's now Medora, uh, North Dakota. And he didn't know what the Badlands were. He didn't see them until the next day. And his first impressions were not that great. He wrote a, a really interesting letter to his wife, Alice, saying, it's chilly and the milk tastes like alkali. And my first impressions are not that great. But, he, as you know, he soon fell in love with the thing. And Joe Ferris was running a, a kind of a... He was running the cantonment there that, that was part of this sort of hunting club. Uh, and he was recommended to Roosevelt as an able guide. And so yeah, he, he uh, knew this country pretty well. And so they, they eventually wound up here. So there weren't many bison. How did the hunt go? And did he succeed? The hunt went terribly. First of all, it, it was a wet, flabby, chilly September. And it rained, and when it rains out here, this, this soil, it looks really strong now, it just turns into muck. It just sticks on everything. Your shoes or boots get stuck in it. And they had all the bad luck you could possibly have. Joe Ferris didn't want to do it in the first place. But they did it, and so it rained. And at one point, uh, Roosevelt fell off the front of his horse into a bed of uh, prickly pear cactus, which is a horrible thing to do. And at another point, they actually were scaring up a buffalo down here somewhere, and Roosevelt's rifle barrel, the horse reared back, and the rifle barrel snapped him in the forehead and opened his vein, and, and blood was just shooting out of it. And blinding Roosevelt, he was wearing spectacles. He was lucky he wasn't more seriously injured. And so everything went wrong. And day after day after day, Joe Ferris basically said to TR, you know, sir, maybe come back. Maybe go back to New York, regroup all, all do some recon. We'll make we'll have a better plan. There'll be better weather. Come back another time and, and do this. And Roosevelt, of course, said, no, that's, that's not the Roosevelt way. I'm going to, we're going to get this, this buffalo. And so I think that Joe Ferris eventually said, Trouble followed us the way a yellow dog follows a truck, <laughs> whatever that means. But I mean, just horrible. And he thought, he thought, he didn't know the measure of the man. He thought he's a New York uh, dandy, he's an aristocrat, he's rich. Um, I'll wear him out, he'll, he'll give up. And Roosevelt would not give up. He just dug in and he was going to get this bison. And, and so, the, as you know, the, the great moment before the, before the day in which they they finally got the bison you know, within about a mile of here, by the way, was when they were out of the, and they, they were so far out that they couldn't get back to the Lang line camp where they were staying night after night. And so they decided to sleep out on the ground. And they were worried that the horses would get spooked. And the dogs would run along. So they actually, if you can imagine it, used their saddles as pillows and kept the reins tied horses, which just sounds you know, insane, actually. And so they're lying down in the middle of the night, a wolf or some, a coyote called, and the horses bolt, and so now they're running around in their long johns in the middle of the night trying to, to settle down, to get it, to settle down the horses. So they finally do. And then Roosevelt says in his extremely colorful account of this, they said it began to rain, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained. He said, finally, I woke up in a puddle of water. I woke up in a little pool of water. Uh, and, uh, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, Sharon, but uh, it's happened to me. It's a horrible experience. And he sat up in this little pool of water, and, and 
Joe Ferris was somewhere right over near him. And Joe Ferris was looking at him like, he'll quit now. You know, this, 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 this is the end. We can go back to Medora and he'll be gone and we'll never see this guy. And Roosevelt sat up and he looked over at Joe Ferris and he said, By Godfrey, but this is fun. <laughs> so I wouldn't have given anything to have witnessed this scene because, first of all, it's exactly why we love Theodore Roosevelt. He was probably as miserable as he had ever been in his life right then. And, and yet it somehow was part of the romance of the old west, the frontier. But he also had decided that the strenuous life was painful. You're going to get hurt. You're going to make up in water. You're going to have rough times. You're going to get cactus in your hands. This is, this, is, this is the fun of it, something, that that's when you're authentically on the frontier. And so he meant it, that it was fun, that this is like, what a great adventure that we're having here. Sure, I'm miserable, but wait, wait till I, I tell the story back in New York. And so, poor Joe Ferris. And so then they, the next day, they come here, and they're following an old bull buffalo. And they're at the, basically the source of Little Cannonball Creek, which is we're within a mile at most from it. And, it, and Roosevelt later said it was in Montana. We're right on the North Dakota-Montana border here. How he would know that, there's no way he could have known that. They had a GPS unit, there were no maps, there were no roads. So he reckoned that they were, from, from whatever maps there were of the, of the watershed, that they were just over the line in Montana. So I've been with people who know this country, the ranchers on Jeeps up through here. We've, we've tried to find the exact site, but it's, 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 a, it's over a few bluffs here. We don't, we don't know, of course, because Roosevelt didn't describe it perfectly, and there's no marker, but we're within a three-minute horse ride, certainly, from where this was. And he, he shot it. Um, he was a terrible shot. Said once, I, 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 I don't shoot well, but I shoot often. And so, the, and then they knew that they had heard it badly, and it, and it went over one of these little bluffs. And then they came over and they found it panting to death and dying. And again, Roosevelt did his Indian war dance, which I'm sure would be regarded as inappropriate today, with whoops and the whole thing. And then he pulled a hundred dollar bill out of his billfold and spontaneously gave it to Joe Ferris. Hundred dollars was a lot of money. I mean, it's still a lot of money, but then it was a gigantic amount of money. And now he's got his buffalo. So now you've seen it. I have seen it. It's beautiful. It's in the north room. In the north room at Sagamore Hill. And well, so very well preserved. say this about this here. This is a remote place, as you said. You have to want to come here. We are half an hour from the nearest gas station, maybe. No cell service, of course. Um, if there's a middle of nowhere in North Dakota, this is it. Almost nobody ever comes here. We, for TR, this was one of the formative moments of his life. You know, that he believed that the bison, the buffalo, was the symbolic, characteristic animal of the Americas. This was it. This was our, this our the shaggy beast. This was this was our uh, iconic quadruped. And he had read in, in his research for the winning of the West and his other books about buffalo hunting. And he wanted to get his buffalo. He was determined to get his buffalo. And he went to a lot of trouble to get this buffalo, and he, all, he wore out Joe Ferris. They wound up becoming close friends. But Joe Ferris would have done anything to get rid of TR during this nine-day period that they're out hunting. So you said earlier he uh, thought about telling the story when he got back to New York. He wrote and, and spoke about
So Roosevelt wrote innumerable articles, as you know, more than 150,000 letters, many of which are about this time in his life. But he also wrote four sustained treatments, a three-volume trilogy, three volumes on basically his hunting life, but a lot of talk about cattle ranching and the frontier, and he had theories of, of frontier development and so on. And then much later, uh, when he had just lost the Bull Moose campaign in 1912, he agreed to write his own biography. So he wrote a ton about this. I mean, we, we always say when people ask, is it 35 books he wrote or 40? Or, it's hard to count because there's some overlap, and it depends on how you divide them up. But let's say he wrote 40 books. One in 10 was about this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of books about the Badlands experience. He just he couldn't he couldn't get enough of it. And as you know, for the rest of his life, he hopelessly exaggerated the amount of time he spent out here. He said, I spent five years out there. One time he said he spent 15 years out there. Well, it turns out if you add it all up, it comes to about a year totally in most time. But you know, you can see what it meant to his heart. Because it meant, I spent some of the most significant time of my life in the Badlands in North Dakota. And, and this is that pivotal spot because to kill a buffalo, I've never killed a buffalo. I've butchered two. And they are mighty beasts. But to kill a buffalo when there were almost none left, and when, when he regarded that as the way, say, a safari person would regard an elephant, or you know, so it was like the premier thing that a great you have you can't call yourself a hunter in the American West unless you have it. And he was so worried that we were going to run out of them, and, and we nearly did. And but here's the end of that story. He went back uh, after this period, and he and George Bird Griffin. It was the first. Um, organization in the United States. And one of their goals was to save the buffalo from extinction. And Roosevelt played, there were about six people, maybe ten, who saved the buffalo. And at the center of, of that cluster of extraordinary human beings was Theodore Roosevelt. And here's why. It, it, you know, it might not appeal to the, to the environmentalist in one, but his view was, I wanted to have that experience of killing a buffalo. I want my sons to have that experience, and I want their grandsons to have that experience. And if we don't save this creature, this primordial American manhood experience, this rite of passage, will pass from the scene. And he had written that probably the buffalo was incompatible with any high level of settlement and civilization. And they all said that. But Roosevelt and others, including Grinnell and William Hornaday, decided to save the buffalo, and they did. And by the time uh, Hornaday died um, in the 1930s, the buffalo was out of trouble. And today, depending on how you count, there are probably half a million bison in North America.
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Clay Jenkins again. Now we have moved to the Interpreter Center in the south unit of the three-unit Theodore Roosevelt National Park, the only national park named for a historic figure. Uh, just to back up for a moment, the, that first live streaming was about five miles south of Medora, and it was as close as we could get in a live stream to the Maltese Cross Ranch or the Chimney View Ranch. We went out there yesterday, and there wasn't connectivity, so we found that gorgeous bluff where President Easton and I had our conversation. And that's as close as we could get. But the the house that the, the cabin that Roosevelt had built for himself out there between September and 1883 and June of 1884 is now here. It's behind me. It's on uh, the campus here of the South Unit Interpretive Center. It's gone all over the country. We'll have another conversation about that in a minute. Before I bring in Wendy Ross, I just want to say hello to Amy Sanderson and Mark Lozo from the inaugural site at Buffalo, and our old colleague, Pam Pierce, who worked in the digital project for a number of years and is now in Portland, Oregon. You're all welcome. We're glad you're part of this. I want to Wait, bring can in- I, Can I interrupt oh, that? Yeah. Uh, I, I, my family had the opportunity to uh, to go to the inaugural site. It's a very fun theater. Oh, okay. So everybody should go there. I just want to put in a pitch for oh, that site. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so is. let's bring in Wendy Ross, the superintendent of yeah. theater, and you, you're wearing a mask, of course. You could I am. Yes, we have to do the bison between us. There you go. <laughs> I've been here since October of 2014. And your father before you in the 90s was superintendent. My father was before me, uh, superintendent from 1990 to 1990. Great costume. This is the best uniform of any federal agency. The green and gray, it's the best contrast. It's of course taken off of an old military style uniform. And it's, um, that flat hat is definitely the recognizable feature of the uniform. And, and I was just at Mammoth in Yellowstone. Of course, it all sort of began there. And at first the military was sort of policing the park. And then in the Organic Act in 1916, we professionalized the management of the parks. And of course, here you are. Here I am. The latest version of this. So tell us a little bit about the travels of this house. Oh, this house, this cabin. Uh, it, it started out, of course, at the World's Fair. And uh, as I told you yesterday, our details um, it, it always escape my brain. So I'm going to depend on you for details for dates. 94, St. Louis, the World's Thank Fair. Thank you. And when it went to the World's Fair, the roof was reduced to a very low-pitched roof. So you will see photographs of this cabin, and it had a very low-pitched roof. And then it traveled all over the country. To Portland for the Lewis Portland. Park Centennial. And then it came back to North Dakota and sat on the Capitol grounds for I don't know decades, how long. Decades. decades. And know, then, you know, North Dakotans of a certain era remember. really remember seeing, the, seeing this building on the Capitol grounds. I can say from my parents, my parents' era, it was, it was a part of going to Bismarck was to see this building on the Capitol huh. grounds. And then in one of the 70s, right. it came here. It came here. But I will direct all of our viewers to the Dickinson State University Theodore Roosevelt Center's digital archives. They have the whole pictorial story of this cabin. They have photographs of it coming to the park and photographs of the roof being restored to the high pitched roof that we see today. So, if, so I would direct you all to go to that site and look at those photos. Which reminds me that your predecessor, Valerie Naylor, helped us to get a grant so that Dickinson State could digitize the holdings of six national park properties beginning with this one. And that enabled us to really start to grab the photographs, the documents, and other materials related to Roosevelt at six parks that had a special tie to him. So we are so glad for that. The work of our digital center, President Easton, is, is famous around the country. We're, we're becoming the comprehensive repository of Roosevelt papers. It's something we are very proud of. And thank you, by the way, for the pitch, Wendy. That was very nice. <laughs> not prearranged, not, you know, uh, but we appreciate that. It, it's it's an amazing resource that Sharon and the TR Center are putting putting together. It is, uh, it's a labor of love and it is a labor. I mean, it is, it is a, a process of going through the documents uh, very carefully and having some knowledge about how they connect together. Uh, it's already an amazing resource. It continues to grow every year. And uh, we always say you can, anyone researching about Theodore Roosevelt, from a fourth grader to a, to a PhD candidate or someone writing a book, 
but we appreciate that pitch. Absolutely. And uh, if you're interested in being volunteer, we, we help us process, you know, once you have the end descriptive metadata, and that's a really interesting thing. Just back to this one, when, when, when it was in uh, St. Louis, the Louisiana purchase at St. Louis, and they brought him into the big arena to see, really too sure, because it was out of context for one thing, and the has changed its shape sometimes, but now it's here permanently. Now it is here permanently. What's it like for you to be the only national park named for his well, it's yesterday. It really focuses our interpretive um, thoughts and what our message is, and yet it expands that interpretive message as well because we have a point from which to begin when we're talking about conservation, when we're talking about different political events and global events, we can start with Theodore Roosevelt and branch out into the future. It really is this hourglass figure of how we take Theodore Roosevelt, interpret him into the future and take his concepts and his legacy and move that into the future with our management objectives. So it's, it's a heady challenge. Every superintendent has a different way of going about it. I am very future oriented. So Theodore Roosevelt's conservation legacy really moves me and makes me want to be the model for conservation in the National Park Service, which of course, if we're associated with Theodore Roosevelt, it's a natural connection there. And it, it really is bridging the history of Theodore Roosevelt's time in the Badlands with that old history of people who lived here for thousands of years, the indigenous people who lived here on the landscape, and the people who live here now, the communities who are here now, and how we can work together in partnership to conserve and protect all of these resources, the cultural and natural resources of the National Park Service, of course, are the most important things that we focus on. So taking Theodore Roosevelt, putting him in that context, and using his legacy to protect and preserve our resources is my challenge, my desire, my um, passion, really. just want to say to everyone, look at this scene with these trees. You, you were here all year, you have that great joy, but for a few days, as beautiful visually as this day. I agree. I agree. The colors are just really popping right now. Of course, a little bit of smoke in the air from our the fires, the fires west. on the west, right? So um, here's a question for you. There are three units to the park, the north unit, the south unit where we are today, and then in the middle a 218 acre homestead, the Elkhorn Ranch. So the Maltese Cross Cabin behind us is really from seven miles south of here, and that's a privately held ranch. The Elkhorn is part of your management, but there's nothing there except a few interpretive signs. So tell us a little bit about why that's important to sort of leave it as it is, as he said. That's interesting um, that you brought that up, Clay, because it really is something that is a, a pilgrimage of people who come here really want to go to the Elkhorn Ranch, to that place where Theodore Roosevelt found solace, he found healing, he had his cattle ranch, um, he rode among the buttes, so it's the place where you can go and actually stand in his footsteps, walk in his footsteps, maybe ride in his horse steps. Um, it's it's only an archaeological site. People go there and there's a little disappointment with some of our visitors when they don't see a reconstructed cabin. Somebody was just telling me yesterday that people are disappointed in our visitor center because they don't have the model of the Elkhorn well, we Ranch borrowed that. that you borrowed several years ago. We'll get it back um, we have it. We have it oh, back. It. Oh, yes, good, we good. have it back. But that model, people really want a tangible something to show them what that looked like. And Theodore Roosevelt, of course, I always, I always ask the question, what would he have wanted in this place right now? And Theodore Roosevelt would not have wanted development. He would have not wanted that the, the cabin to be the central focus. He would have wanted the Badlands of North Dakota to be the central focus and the cradle of conservation, really. It was remote then. It's still remote. It is You have to walk to get there. And when you go there, it's not as if you don't see some signs of the 21st century, but they're really muted. I mean, it is yes. about as close to the original place as you could get, minus the building. 
and we have worked really hard. Valerie Naylor before me with the Bakken boom, the oil boom, of course, happened um, during her watch, really started in 2008, got going in 2010, and in 2012, we had quite a bit of oil and gas development around the Elkhorn Ranch. She worked with oil companies directly. We reached out to those companies. We worked with them with the visuals and reducing those visuals so that we can have that cabin site really unimpaired for future generations. And what we're also seeing is some of the oil companies are starting to take down their infrastructure. So we're actually restoring the landscape around it. And it's very exciting. 70,000 acres, a little of the wilderness. Right. Yes. Amazing park. You can see buffalo, elk. Big horn sheep. Uh, buffalo and antelope, big horn sheep. Sure. Prairie dogs, of course. Yes. Um, owls. Uh, amazing. And you, and you don't have to try very hard because you sort of see them. And feral horses. Right. Elk. Elk, of course. I'm going to get the camera. Right down there. Let's go. Into the cabin. Absolutely. Uh, so this is the cabin, and um, it, you do you have some plexiglass. You interpret it. Uh, people can go in and sort of peer around. This is sort of one of your treasures. This is that sort of raise the hair on your hands moment when you you step into the actual place. So here it is. This was not his permanent home. I'll just show you a few things here, everyone. This is the um, the parlor, if you want to call it that, you see the you know, the stove, the the furnace, um, wood burning and sometimes coal. Those are rocking chairs, and of course, if you know your Roosevelt, he said, "What? Which, which American does not love a rocking chair?" And talked many times about sitting on the veranda of the Elkhorn cabin, uh, which faced east and was right uh, about 15 yards from the banks of the Little Missouri River. You see here the, the table is set for a, that's a pretty elegant table for 1884 on the frontier. And then if I just move over here, this is the kitchen. And here you see, again, the plexiglass causes a little bit of distortion. There's the, the stove and the wheat or coffee grinder and the lamp. And now I'll take you to Roosevelt's bedroom, uh, with his permission, of course. And here you see uh, a buffalo robe on the bed, pretty Spartan. There was an upstairs where the, um, the hired men would sleep. And that's an authentic Roosevelt trunk. You can maybe see the T-R on it. Uh, but that's the sort of luggage that a, a wealthy person would put on the train as he came out here um, every year. He spent the... On and off, parts of four years here, total elapsed time about 360 days by our calculations. Here's his wash basin, and then a shaving cup in the mirror. You get a sense, it's funky. It's maybe 30 feet or 25 feet by 15. It wasn't enough, and it wasn't remote enough for him. So when he came back after the death of his mother and his wife on Valentine's Day, 1884, he wanted a place to grieve. He wanted a place to hunt, to write, to regroup, to, 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 to think what his life subsequently would be. He wrote a number of um, parts of, of his books up at the Elkhorn, and he wanted a bigger place. And that one was 30 feet by 60, so 1,800 square feet, which is a pretty large house. So uh, it's worth coming here just to see this extraordinary uh, monument to Roosevelt's first home here. So, You've been here, of course. I have, I have. It's an amazing place. Yeah, I do want to step in. It do. It do. Rod Sullivan has a wonderful question. The photograph of Theodore Roosevelt in the doorway, he says, is that at the Maltese Cross or the Elkhorn? The, the famous photograph of him reading on a chair with a dog on his lap. I think so. That is a photograph from Colorado. Um, that's in the western slope of Colorado. I think that dog was was it skippy there was I think it's, skip. it's skip and he was there and it, it's i know it's not your favorite it's my favorite of all uh, roosevelt photographs because he's reading and he's in repose and he's in kind of shabby clothing and you can see he's just perfectly happy and the dog is happy too to sit on his lap so but that's a colorado photograph not a north dakota one thank you for that rod yeah thanks for those <laughs> questions keep the questions coming what do you think sir oh i've always i i you know I've always gotten a charge out of going in there. It's One of my goals is, is that we'll do a 3D photography, just like really intense three-dimensional photography so that people can have a, almost a, a visual tour and wander around and, 
and, and virtually hold objects in their hands in there. And it is, you know, it's, 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 I think it's always a little disappointing at first when people visit here and they want, they want this to have been the place where it was. Where the location. And that's, that's perfectly understandable. But this, ha this building is sort of a world, well, not a world travel, but you see, all over a the country countrywide, a countrywide travel. So it's actually kind of interesting how that how it got to this this spot. It's been dismantled and put back together and taken all over the country. And Alice, his daughter, actually was at the World's Fair in St. Louis in uh, nineteen four, and she was she brought a plaque, and she tapped that bronze plaque on the side of the building. That plaque, by the way, is in the State Historical Society of North Dakota. But she was able to authenticate, even though her father was not so sure that this was the famous. <laughs> Maltese Cross Cabin. Hey folks, we don't mean to get in your way. These are the, the citizens who have come to see this great place. This is Wendy Ross, the superintendent of the park and President Easton of Dickinson State University. We're taking people on a virtual tour of Theodore Roosevelt's country. And so we're glad you're part of it. Thanks, I'm sorry we got in your way here. I was just eavesdropping. So Wendy, can you come with us over to the bookstore? Absolutely. And you, you can provide- I mask on though. Oh, indeed, yes. All right, well, we're heading to the Western Edge Bookstore, which is a couple of blocks from here, to meet with our, our friend, the owner of the bookstore, Doug Ellison, and he has some interesting thoughts about TR and mythology that we'll go into. Here we are at the base of Bullion Butte. You can see it behind me, the largest butte in North Dakota. I've been up it many times. The view from on top of the butte is absolutely spectacular. Roosevelt was here a number of times. One of my very favorite Roosevelt stories occurred about, let's say, three or four miles from here uh, at the base of another butte, Black Butte. Roosevelt came back after the death of his wife and his mother in the spring of 1884. He turned up in Medora. He went to the office of the Badlands Cowboy. He made it clear that he wanted to find a second ranch where he would be more remote from the traffic patterns of the Badlands. And he came down to see his old friends Gregor and Lincoln Lang at the, at the source of, of, of Cannonball Creek, which is uh, 30 or 40 miles from here. They had befriended him when he first came to the Badlands. They were his most intellectually uh, conversant and compatible friends here. And he always made it a habit to come see the Langs, whatever else he did. When he arrived at the cabin, Gregor Lang said, what, what are your goals? What do you want to do while you're in the Badlands this time, Mr. Roosevelt? And Roosevelt said, I want to kill an antelope, a pronghorn antelope. And I want to get myself, if possible, an authentic buckskin shirt, an authentic buckskin tunic. And the legs said, the antelope's going to be no problem. What's the deal on the buckskin shirt? And Roosevelt went into this long theory that Daniel Boone had a buckskin shirt and Davy Crockett, and that this was the this was the supreme dress of the American frontiersman, that really it was the most characteristic of all the glowing patterns of the New World, and that he could never be completely authentic until he had a buckskin shirt. So uh, Lincoln Lang, who was about 16 years old at the time, said, well, if we go east 30 or 40 miles outside of the Badlands, we'll probably be able to get a antelope. They prefer more open country. And there is a woman over there on the Keogh Trail on Sand Creek who is known to be a skin dresser. She knows how to make buckskin clothing. And so Roosevelt said, of course, bully. And off they went. And they made the long ride over to Mrs. Maddox's cabin. And all the way over, Roosevelt went on and on and on about the importance of the buckskin tunic. And finally, Lincoln Lang said, you know, Mrs. Maddox is sort of a tough cookie. She's no nonsense. She probably doesn't want to hear that kind of talk. Just be polite. She'll take your measurements. Offer her the amount of money she's going to need. So they actually she took Roosevelt's measurements and a couple of weeks later he got his authentic buckskin tunic and on the way back, on the way back to the Lang cabin. They came upon a small herd of property. Roosevelt was able to kill one of them. This was another of the great checklist of the hunting experience. 
experiences that he wanted during his time here. And he was so excited. This happened every time he, he made his first kill of something. He did a kind of an Indian war dance around the carcass, and he spontaneously offered a rifle to Lincoln Lang as a, as a, as a gift for him. And he said, this young man, to this very uh, charismatic and voluble Easterner, he said, no, I won't accept the gift of the rifle. I know you feel that now, but you may you calm down. You may be sorry that you made so uh, magnanimous a gesture. I want you to keep the rifle, please. And Roosevelt was impressed by that because he understood that Lincoln Lang had character. And speaking of Lincoln Lang, after Roosevelt first went down to the Lang cabin, which is his headquarters for the buffalo hunt in September of 1883, Lincoln Lang was one of the cons of this, this crude uh, log cabin. And he would go to bed at night, and he said as he fell asleep, uh, you know, completely tired from all of the activities on the ranch, he would hear his father Gregor, a Scotsman, talking about politics, talking about history, talking about America, talking about freedom and other concepts deep into the night, talking about the cattle industry. And Lincoln said, I would, I would stay awake as long as I possibly could, and then I would find myself drifting off. But he said, all of my life, since we moved to America, I had heard about liberty and freedom and the Constitution and the American dream. He said, it all seemed like just rhetoric and language until I heard this Roosevelt talk. And then for the first time in my life, I believed that those great American ideals were true. <laughs> That's just a spectacular tribute to Theodore Roosevelt and the young Lincoln Lang. So that, that extraordinary experience of the authentic tunic and the pronghorn antelope occurred not far from here, right in the vicinity of North Dakota's largest butte, Napoleon. So I'm here with Sharon Kilzer, the project manager at the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State University and the one who organizes these extraordinary symposia every year. Sharon, we are in the heart of your beloved Badlands. Yes, it's an amazing day to be out here. It is so beautiful. Early fall in North Dakota is my favorite season and the Badlands are a wonderful place to be. Um, and it's such a privilege to be in this place at this time. You've lived here all of your life, or most of your life. What is it that makes this part of North Dakota so special to you? Um, this is my heart home. Uh, <laughs> people, other people say, you know, where is your natural habitat? Um, this is mine, and uh, the Badlands Buttes, um, the brokenness of the country here, the arid country, uh, of course, it's very green right now, but that is not usual at this time of year. Um, Again, it's just, it's where my heart is at home. So when we started these symposia now 15 years ago, one of the things you and I immediately both agreed on is that every year there had to be a field trip into Roosevelt's Badlands. And, and just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, when people come to Western North Dakota, it's easy to drive the interstate and to get a glimpse of the Badlands, but there's something else to getting off the interstate highway out into the gravel roads uh, out here. Um, and experiencing the solitude and the peace, uh, the quiet. You can hear the crickets singing right now as we speak. Um, and it's a, it's just a very unique experience, and we'd love to share that with other people. I remember one year when we had a group of people from all over the country, really deep Roosevelt lovers, and they had been to North Dakota, most of them at some point, and had been to Medora, and had maybe gone to the Medora Musical and gone, gone on the Loop Road in the Badlands. We took them down here into the heart of the southern Badlands and on some of the most remote gravel and scoria roads in the country. And I remember some of them were a little kind of uneasy, like well, we're, we're really out there. We're in the middle of absolute nowhere. And it's not that they were anxious, but they, they I don't think they'd ever seen anything like it. Yes, there is an anxiety for some people getting far from the beaten path. Um, we're out here for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes and not a vehicle passes by. So if you did have a breakdown of some kind, it might be some time before someone came through. Um, 
but that's part of the experience. That's part of what Roosevelt actually sought here was that solitude and that separation from uh, civilization um, and other folks who were visiting this area. So um, it's a great experience to to step out of your comfort zone and experience. This is prickly pear cactus. These are actually quite large for North Dakota. They grow in disturbed places, but they're all over the Great Plains. Um, if you get one of these spines stuck in your sock or in your arm, it's, uh, it hurts. And if you fall into one, that's a bad day. And according to Roosevelt's own account on that famous buffalo hunt, uh, he fell hands first and trying to break his fall into a bed of cactus. And he said he spent a lot of time pulling the cactus spines out of his hands and his arms. So, um, yeah, this is an unusually beautiful little stand. And if you were, if you're, if you're dying of, of dehydration, and you have a knife, you can cut into them and there's just enough moisture in a prickly pear to keep you alive. back everyone Clay Jenkins and I'm with Doug Ellison one of my dearest friends he's the um, owner of this bookstore the Western Edge it's one of the great independent bookstores in the American West also has a bed and breakfast called the Anvil Inn and Doug I'm so glad you're with us you've been a dear friend to this project at Dickinson State University and then you wrote this book I, mean, I remember we had you for a symposium and you said you were going to come and talk about some of the background for the great stories, you know, punching out a gunslinger in a bar in Weibo, and the both of these, and getting them to justice, and uh, confronting uh, E.G. Paddock when Paddock had threatened to kill T.R., and his near duel with the Marquis de Mora, and so on. And then you gave a lecture, and you, you began to use your critical acumen to, to point some you know, holes in Roosevelt's accounts. And I think you said, Many of these stories are embellished, and some of them are whoppers. And I said, you will never again be invited to the Kansas State University. And here you are, still laughing well, about this. Yeah, and I have not been back to DSU, yeah, have right. I? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and but, I have to say, this was one of my favorite talks at one of the Dickinson <laughs> State University symposiums. Thank you, thank Having you. come from a science oh, background. Well, so you. what's the deal? I mean, okay, he did embellish, right? Well, he did. Uh, well, I, I think it was that Mark Twain era where, you know, if you're going to tell a story, tell a good story, and uh, which is fine. They are great stories, but but to me, the danger has been that uh, so many biographers and others uh, who write about TR uh, just repeat his stories uncritically down through the decades. Because we believe that he was telling the truth. Yes, of course he was. <laughs> and, uh, and that gets repeated. And... Uh, that's the danger, I think. And, and when you go back to the original sources, uh, it, it wasn't always as TR said it was. And you think that I mean, it's worth it's worth knowing the truth. Mm -hmm. Does it does it disappoint you that he was doing this sort of frontier fall tale? Uh, you know, it, it, it kind of did at first, honestly. Uh, you know, I wondered why he was uh, embellishing. Uh, but I've, I've come to understand a little bit that, again, like I said, it was uh, it, it was story time. You know, he wanted to entertain his readers, and he was not the only one. In fact, probably in that era, everybody pretty much did it. You know, well, Mark Twain's roughing it is not verifiable. I mean, yeah, this and, was that tradition. John Hayes. Yeah, Ohio and uh, yep, 
and there were other uh, historical personalities, writers who did the same thing. I mean, he was he was far from being the only one who did it. And uh, uh, a mountain man named Bill Hamilton that I've written on did the same thing. Uh, Andy Adams, who did a great book, Log of a Cowboy, did the same thing. Uh, so they were so, almost yeah. expected to. So yeah. This book, Theater of the and Tales Told, is true of his time in the West is yours, and people can get it in a number of ways. Yeah, at, at the store. This I, store is incredible. How do you manage to have such a, a, a huge inventory oh, in the middle of nowhere? Well, uh, because of summertime in Medora, we're, we're, with the visitors we get, we're, uh, that, that's enough to keep us here from year to year. Uh, we need the summer visitation. We are open year round. Uh, a lot of, not a lot, but a number, a number of Fedora businesses do stay open all year, which surprises people. They think we're uh, strictly a summer town. We, we're not. We're open year round. Wendy's uh, National Park, of course, is open year round. Uh, a number of businesses are. So uh, I tell people all, all summer that they really should see the Badlands under snow cover because it's like seeing them for the first time. But you can do eight months per year. Right? <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> almost, almost. Yeah. Six. Let's go to one of these stories. So the famous story of punching out the gunslinger in the bar in Weibo, that called Mingusville. He goes in and the, the gunslinger has is shooting up the bar with pistols. He says TR's going to stand drinks for the house. TR hesitates, tries to hide. Eventually he uh, hits for the right and then a left and down goes the gunslinger. TR disarms him and uh, he brings some frontier justice. Is that a true story? Well, I, I think he probably did. Uh, hit a guy in, in, in <laughs> Mingusville. I think he probably did. You know, he was a boxer right, at Harvard, and, Harvard yeah. and he uh, and he he always stood up for his rights. You know, he uh, I think that's clear. pretty hard to believe that the gunslinger had pistols. Yeah, and, and that you know to hear the story be told and retold, uh, everyone in the bar was kind of cowering and afraid to say a word. But T.R. alone had the manly. You know, kind of the Lone Ranger walks in right. and saves the day. Uh, I think there was an episode. I think uh, I think everything probably that TR wrote about started with a germ of truth uh, and, and became embellished. Is there any independent documentation of that incident? It not all that, comes straight from TR. Not that I've ever found. Right, right. Uh, I think it originated with, with TR. So um, pushing forward to the, the boat deep story, which we know did happen, and it's mm -hmm. much more authentic than, than some of these others. Um, you know that TR later recreated the scene with some photographs. He was an amateur photographer, he may have had a darker here. Um, but he staged these with his hired men, and people wondered where were where were those photographs actually taken? And you figured it out. Well, uh, Rolf Sledden and, and and I and others uh, over the years, we we've, we've had a friendly debate going on about those photos. I know in, in a number of the TR biographies they. They also discussed that were the were the photos taken in real time or were they staged later? And uh, when when Rolf Sledden did his uh, his, his book, uh, he determined that uh, all but one of the photos was staged at the Elkhorn later. He matched up the background landscape and it was taken at the Elkhorn. But he which makes sense. Yeah, uh, the famous photo of, of Sewell and Dow in the boat, uh, Rolf had been un unable to locate. And uh, so, uh, in, in researching the, the book, which which again is is based on that talk I gave at your at your symposium, uh, I thought, well, let me uh, try to bring this to fruition. So, uh, I, to make a long story short, I did locate where that boat photo was taken. It's just off the north unit of the national park, which so, which is sort of where they come out. I mean, it's not quite where they came out, but they yeah. had to go overland at some point. And, yeah, and that's sort of where it was. That, that's right, and it, it kind of moved that entire story further west than all the accepted uh, stories had put it. So, in other words, uh, Rolf and I were both right and both wrong. Uh, you know, he did have a camera with him, obviously, on the trip, and he took at least because he wouldn't have gone that far back to take the reproduction photo. Yeah, yeah, it was probably hard to get camera to. on the adventure. Maybe the only Old West manhunter who actually took a gun and a camera to record it for posterity. And he was right? reading Anna Karenina. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, too. So he's got he, some he, he can multitask like no one else. Uh, but but he did have the camera with him, obviously. And and uh, for whatever reason, he uh, only the one photo survives, 
we we think he must have taken others because he he, he said, said in his writing he said that it's the most when they were behind the ice jam it's the most monotonous week I ever put in in my life sitting behind that ice jam. He was reading, you know. Well, he did. Have, he was reading dime novels at right. that point, right? That the thieves said. Yeah, he life borrowed of, a, life uh, of Jesse uh, James from, from <laughs> redheaded Mike Finnegan. He said, I say, old chap, you don't have a and he did. He had a book. <laughs> exactly. So, so some of these stories are so colorful, even when they're true. Yeah. That it makes you wonder where truth and myth. Yeah, and, and, and why why feel the need to uh, improve them? Because they were great stories, just uh, on factual. So what basis. you're showing is that, in spite of the fact that you wrote this highly irresponsible book, <laughs> you actually have done serious on the ground research. Well, I have solved I've, some I've, real problems. I try. I've tried to. Yeah. And now we all have to go back now and then kind of add footnotes to the stories that we tell. Yeah. Because now you've got uh, you've got me in a kind of fretting state every time I tell a Roosevelt story. I think, thank goodness, Doug's not here. You know, <laughs> the, the chat, I, uh, uh, I found additional stories too. If, if, if I ever sell out and, and, and you sold out, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I have additional material to add. To add to the yeah, next version yeah, of this book. Yeah. So, and what about Lippy Slim? Now, Lippy Slim, he mentions as a, as a notorious. Uh, bad guy. Yeah. Uh, your view is there is no such identifiable person as racist. Well, according to TR, uh, you know, Lippy was lynched by Granville Stewart's vigilantes, and he and Bullock uh, on the trail in the 1890s are talking about the old days, right? And whatever happened to Lippy Slim, who, who uh, TR is telling Seth, uh, you wanted him, but I got him. You know, and I, you know, I, uh, I get the honors for that. And what happened to Lippy? And, Seth says, according to T.R. Seth says, oh, Granville Stewart, you know, which would put it back to the early, mid-1880s. Anyway, uh, you know, I've done a lot of outlaw lawman research over the years, and I'm thinking, who's this Lippy Slim, which is who I've never heard of. His in, in, well, it might have been the, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Slim. We'll call our child Lippy. <laughs> <laughs> but I know we, we, we've talked in the past. You I said, believe who, who, who would invent that name? Right, no one would said, invent that. T.R. would. Apparently, never, never. <laughs> but so my goal, my only remaining goal in life, is to prove that Libby Slim existed and he went on to be a senator from Utah or something. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. If you could do that, yeah. I, I eagerly await. But you're not done writing about Rose. Uh, I, I'd like to revise that honestly. Yeah, because there there is more material out there. He's a, he's such a fascinating character. I mean, honestly, uh, you know, he, he he's he's an addicting character. Uh, uh, and I, I admire him greatly. Don't don't get the wrong impression. That's why I tried to keep this kind of lighthearted and dedicated the book to Lippy Slim. And, which, and which uh, is only right. If, if you remember, I had the only, actually the only known image of Lippy Slim in the book right here. Wow. <laughs> Let uh, me ask you one last serious question. <laughs> Several people have uh, been chatting in on our on our Zoom site saying, "How did the Badlands get their name? Because they look so gorgeous today." So mm -hmm. give us a little background on how the Badlands became known as the Badlands. Well. Uh, uh, I think the actual phrase, the Badlands, which has come down to us, uh, uh, was from the French trappers. Right. Uh, as I understand it, they had a French phrase, I don't speak French, but Badlands, it sounds like. Which, which literally meant Badlands to cross. Right. Uh, you know, even the natives, as I understand it, they hunted the Badlands, but did not uh, live here, that, obviously. In the Koshikat, is my understanding, uh, the translation would be Badlands. Oh, yeah, Eastern Montana. Eastern Montana. Right. yeah, so it was just a common description of, of this country uh, by anyone who tried to cross it. It was it was tough to get and across. General Sully came in 1864 to chastise the Dakota, right. and he said it looked like hell with the fires put out. Yeah. One of his officers had an even more interesting. Yeah, thing. that was uh, Sully actually blazed this military trail just south of Medora that was used by a number of expeditions, but uh, Sully blazed it in 1864. and. Despaired of getting across, he was heading west and uh, felt he would. There, he had what 2,500 men and 100 wagons, and uh, thought he would have to detour. He's running out of rations. He thought he would have to detour far to the south, and his men would run out of rations. And uh, he had one young Indian guide, one young Dakota guide, who said Dakota. he had he had uh, yeah Santee as I or Yankton. I'm sorry, Yankton too. I believe so. Not friendly with the Lakota. No, no. There there were a lot of factions, and and that that's another interesting area of all the, the factions among the natives who some scouted for the army, of course some fought the army. Um, 
but he said he had hunted in here. This apparently teenage boy he said he had hunted in the Badlands. He could get him across. So he, and he did. He took a bullet in the shoulder doing it. But uh, one of Sully's officers, to get to your question, yes, he he had a great description of the Badlands uh, in a, in a letter back to Iowa. He said. Uh, trying to describe the Badlands, he said it seemed as if Mother Nature was trying to overdo herself and in fact went on a spree which terminated in delirium tremens, which I <laughs> thought DTs. was a great, the DTs, and that, that was his impression of the Badlands. Possibly blasphemous, but, okay, but still. <laughs> and, and that's, you're right, that's when Sully got across and uh, having been sniped at and fighting the, the Lakota all the way and looked back apparently and, and said that was hell with the fires out. This is the Battle of Square Butte occurred here in the right. summer of, of, of 64, 1864. And that brought the Indian Wars to Dakota Territory. They yes. really had, this hadn't been a place of conflict really before yes. that. That's right. Uh, Sitting Bull and, and his Lakota, you know, explained it later that they had nothing to do with the, uh, with the war. Uh, they said, you know, correctly, they said it started in the East and we were dragged into it. Which they were, and they were chastising not the people who were engaged in the, in the Minnesota uprising. They're very but few cousins of yeah. theirs. Who yeah, were, um, uh, a few, a few. Uh, uh, apparently, Sant San Santee Incaduta and his Santees had had joined the the Lakota, but a very few, uh, you know, from Minnesota had joined the the Western Sioux. Um, but but they were all punished. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, I envy you your role here, you have your bed and breakfast, the Anne Boleyn, you have this bookstore, and everyone who comes to Medora sort of discovers this and says, amazing that there is such a, a bookstore and a center in this place. So, Wendy, I have a question for you. Um, you know, so many people speculate about the feral horses in the park and whether they're related at all. The city, well, I know that's a complex issue, but what's the best way to begin thinking about that? I think there are a lot of pieces of historical fiction facts and scientific right. information that all come together with the feral horses that have been fenced into the park. You know, they were the, the group of horses that are now in the park were actually fenced into the park when the park was fenced. When we brought license. So they weren't brought in. They so were they were not brought in. in. They were fenced in. They were there and they were very difficult to capture. So they were fenced into the park. And I, I think there are cultural ties to those horses. Of course, there would be um, any horse in this area that came through that historical time period would have had ties. Now, the exact ties and, you know, at Knife River Indian villages, they used to ask which earth lodge was Sacagawea's. Um, that, that piece of history, we don't really have that muscle piece. So um, I'm going to defer. Is there um, a DNA test that could help ascertain this? I'm not sure we have the other piece of the comparison. Right, the, the, the actual authentic. But what we can look at are unique pieces of DNA and the genetic code that might point us to different areas that these horses might have come from. And when you look at the larger population of horses in the United States, you can start to get that better, um, more clear picture. And then what you can do is take the cultural thoughts and histories from Native Americans and anybody else who has historical information and you put those pieces together, very similar to what Doug did with Theodore Roosevelt, and you start to get the real picture and you weed out yeah, some of so those facts that might picture. be getting in the way of the real picture. Right. So that, that makes perfect sense. But so people ask all the time, did Roosevelt have a place in the South? And the answer is no, but he went through many times, of course. Correct. And then the Elkhorn was his major homestead yes. here. And people have asked about the the idea of recreating the Elkhorn cabin. You know, we, we've been talking about that for the last 15 or 20 years. Some ranchers have um, generously supplied uh, cottonwood logs. We're not quite sure what the status of that is, but you don't have any interest in having it out there. You want to keep that as pristine as possible. That is my wish. Um, having said that, things, um, things develop. develop and change, <laughs> um, especially with 
different, um, I know you're doing your symposium on um, kind of allies in the arena and those partnerships that we bring to the table and those partnerships that sustain and really support us um, can lend themselves to new ideas and thoughts that we never dreamed of. So I'm going to also not answer that fully. <laughs> I understand, but you have the joy of, you know, there are many national parks, and I suppose some people come here because it's a national park, but they immediately become aware that a great personage was here, and that really deepens the interpretation. The park was created in 1947 mm -hmm. uh, as a national memorial park, but in 1978, under an omnibus bill, it became a bona fide, full-on national park. What's Correct. the visitation, roughly, for animals? Between 700 and 750,000. Uh, 2016 was our highest visitation, 754. And you have, of course, a very complex management plan. You have to, you have to think about the elk, about populations, habitat. Mm -hmm. You've been doing some control burning to restore some native grasses and, and so on. Um, and you have to think about the oil business, of course, because the, the larger Little Missouri Valley is oil rich. And, uh, when the boom was on, that was a pretty high pressure, less so now. And I will take it to another place, your comment just now. The oil group boom brought a new group of people that has fallen in love with this park More and this area. Um, it, I think we have been able to reach out to new groups of people, diverse groups of people that we never would have dreamed of in the 1990s when my father was superintendent here. Uh, we have people of color, we have people of different cultures and origins, and all of those people are coming to the park. We're seeing different groups of people that we've never seen before, and it's amazing. And in this year when there's been so much disruption, park visitation has been high. You see people high. are really mm -hmm. you know, stir crazy in their homes and ready to get out and see America. Correct. I think national parks have become the the healing balm for people who are uh, coming out of quarantine or going crazy with quarantine. Our March numbers were as high as our June numbers. And March is, is not the best month. March yet. is one of the lowest visitation months that you can uh, expect. And, and we were surprised. And as I told you yesterday, our limiting factor was our ball toilets. Um, when they began to fill up, we had to close the park because it became a safety issue. And, and you started seeing that high use in, in different impacts in the park. So you're going, you got the winter coming, and the, so it gets a little quieter here. Mm -hmm. You're going to do more research and maybe correct some of the whopping errors of, of, of this book. Yeah. Um, and you have other books in mind. Yeah, there's uh, plenty, of, uh, plenty of topics. I, I start a lot of projects. I don't finish very many, fortunately. <laughs> That's what I try to do when things do slow down. It gives me a chance to catch up on reading and research and writing. Try, try to keep up. We're going to go to, and I, I don't think you can come because you have to man the store here, yeah. but we're going to go out to the Riley Lufsey kill site. So just quickly set that up. Marquis de Mores is this wealthy French aristocrat. Mm -hmm. He comes here, kind of lords him over everybody gets into a squabble about fencing and so on. What, what happened? Yes, that, that's a early 1883, before TR arrived here, the Marquis was actually a newcomer here. Uh, that's only a couple of months after he had first arrived here and uh, hired some of the locals to, to work for him, Jerry Paddock, among others, uh, who had a kind of a nefarious reputation here. He already killed a man in Little Missouri across the river. And, uh, uh, a lot of this actually stems from uh, Paddock and Frank O'Donnell having a little feud going. And uh, O'Donnell- so pre-existing feuds. Yes, the Marquis runs yes. Uh, O'Donnell and, and his, his group were hunters uh, and uh, the Marquis proceeded to buy land and fence land, which hadn't been done here before. Fenced across the hunting trails, which O'Donnell and Lufsey and his group- So they were fence cutting the fences and so on. They would cut the fence and, and things escalated very quickly and uh, um, the Marquis, in fact, testified. He went to his his foreman, Paddock, uh, the the gunfighter, and said, "What do I do? My life's being threatened." And Paddock said, "Shoot first. Uh, that, that's in the trial testimony. You know, he said, "Get the first shot in." 
So the marquee took him at his word. They uh, about a mile west of town where you're where you're right going now. right now um, is where approximately where the gunfight took place. Uh, there's still debate on whether uh, there was debate at the trial. Was it an ambush or did the hunters shoot first? Well, the marquee had gotten advice to shoot first. Lufsey was killed. Um, O'Donnell and, and Wanigan, the other fellow, Wanigan later worked for Roosevelt, were taken under arrest to Mandan. Eventually, the Marquis was tried for Lufsey's murder. He and Paddock were both charged with murder. Uh, the Marquis was acquitted two years later. The charges against Paddock were dropped at that point. Nobody was ever convicted of Lufsey's death. But this cloud hung over the Marquis for his entire time out here. And very, people never got over it. Very much so. Yeah. Even his obituary 10 years later always mentioned that he had killed a man in Dakota. You know, kind of gave him that. Could be a badge of honor. Some, yeah, it was kind of like, well, he, he had clout. You know, he killed his man, as they said. And he was a duelist. And, of course, we don't have time for it. But he and Roosevelt kind of edged towards what might have become a duel. And I think your view is it wasn't yeah. going to be a duel. But. Yeah, I, I don't think the Marquis intended it to be a, a, a duel. Uh, it could be read that way. I think Roosevelt honestly did feel he was being challenged, uh, but it, it, it got uh, smoothed over pretty quickly. What I love about that story is that, is that Roosevelt felt it would be a duel, and of course he had to show up because he was Roosevelt, and, but he got to choose the weapons, and he was going to be rifles at 15 paces. So even Roosevelt, as blind as he was, you know, <laughs> you're both going to die in that right, duel. Right. And so he wisely, uh, yeah. they wisely backed away from it. We need to get out there. We so appreciate your oh, time. Great. We're hoping for a reformation. We probably aren't going to get it from you. <laughs> but uh, people can buy this book, Peter Rosa, and Tales Told as Truth of This Time in the West by Douglas W. Ellison. You're our dear friend, and thanks for hosting us for a minute. Today. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Okay, we're going to go live. We're going to carry the camera. And you're going to drive with us. Perfect. See you soon. Yes, you were great. This is this is our our vehicle, which is seems a little powerful for the for the quest that we're on. But we're now heading to the Riley Lufsey site, and we may lose you, but we did this yesterday, and I think you'll be able to follow us along. So here's here's the bookstore, and there is the old courthouse, which is now a museum. Putting my seatbelt on is a good. <laughs> All right, so Sharon is does many things, and she is pulling out of the Western Edge Bookshop. Interesting, Mr. President, this conversation with Doug Ellison. Oh yeah, that was fascinating. <laughs> he's a very, he's a wonderful guy and a great historian and you know he really did shock us at that symposium but he turned out to be right about these things and so that's the kind of history we we need to promote oh absolutely yeah it, you know it, it's fun to get the real story yeah. and we all story. tell stories of okay? course you know we uh, in my in my other profession of law you find out that our me our memory is a very unreliable source of information <laughs> but we all need our memories too right Exactly. Well, you've all Harari in this book, Homo Deus, as we have our experiencing self, and then we have our narrating self. And our narrating self creates stories that are make us the hero and are agreeable to us and tidy up the, the, the raw stuff of, of real life. And certainly, Roosevelt, you know, having read Maine Reed and all of these boy books about the white buffalo hunter and you know, boys who go out into the frontier and, and fend for themselves, he he got caught up in that romance of the West early on. So now we're going past the entrance to Theodore Roosevelt National Park, shown here. That's Chimney Butte, or Chimney Park over here. This is where the Marquis de Mores had an abattoir, he had a slaughterhouse. He was taking advantage of the emerging technology of refrigerator cars, and he had a slaughterhouse here. Thank goodness it's not here. Now you can see the incredible cottonwoods here. And then there's this bike trail. We're going to cross now the the great and sacred little Missouri River. You'll see just a little of it here. And you see, Mr. President, it's not very deep. This is about typical for this time of year. It's probably knee deep out there. Yeah, the, the, the rivers in this part of the world, you know, know more about them, of course, Clay, but they are 
They are rivers in the in the uh, spring months of snow melt, and they get they get smaller and smaller as we as we go through the summer. They sure do, and you can walk across it. Roosevelt uh, rode across the river twenty three times between here and the Elkhorn. We just passed the former village of Little Missouri, which is the place he originally came to. And that's where the Pyramid Park Hotel was. They have not reconstructed it because it's a it's a part of land that's subject to flooding. The Missouri sometimes gets ice jams and floods pretty considerably once every eight or nine years. And so now we're just coming into the site of this event. It was probably an ambush. This is sort of the, the choke point to get out of the vicinity of Medora and up onto the bluffs where these hunters used to go. And so when the Marquis was advised to defend himself, if necessary, by shooting, he and several of his men positioned themselves over here. And then when Riley Lefsey and the others um, came riding through, uh, that's when the melee occurred. And, and one, several were wounded, but Riley Lefsey was killed and it became a kind of a scandal that wouldn't go away for uh, this French aristocrat, the Marquis de Moraes. So Sharon wait, is, wait, yeah. Can I ask? I'm sorry, no, 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 please, no. I was just to say, Sharon is expanding on the beauty of this day. Go ahead, Mr. President. Uh, so, what, what really was the, was the relationship, if any, between between the Marquis and Roosevelt? Best you can tell. Uh, cordial, sometimes chilly. Uh, they were two very powerful aristocrats. The diff here's the difference, which I think they got along. They dined with each other, including in New York. They exchanged books. Um, they, you know, they sort of traveled in the same circles after a fashion. Uh, the Marquis had married a, a, the daughter of a New York banker and an industrialist. And so they, they were friendly, but the Marquis was sort of the lord of the Badlands, and he, and, he, and he lorded it over people. And Roosevelt was a small-D Democrat. He wanted everyone to love him. He wanted to throw himself into the activities out here. And so they just saw the world in fundamentally different ways. Roosevelt said that Medora... Uh, the wife of the Marquis was actually a better hunter, a better marksman, and a better horseback rider than the Marquis himself. So she must have been something, uh, an amazing woman. So here's the site. Lefsey born in Missouri, died here on June 26th, 1883. Um, the trials occurred in Roosevelt was a dear friend of Joe Ferris, and Ferris was um, kept a general store here and was kind of a banker. He would lend money or sort of exchange money. And so he actually uh, provided some of the travel money for several people who um, testified against the Marquis over in Mandan. And because of that, the Marquis felt that Roosevelt might be involved, might be actually egging on the prosecution. And that's what led to that exchange of letters that could have been uh, a duel. And here you see the Marquis with all of his sort of French arrogance and hauteur. It does tell you something interesting that the, a trial of an event here took place, what, 150, 160 no miles here. east of here. Yeah, and that, 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 that is, that's interesting, you know, uh, and you know, we, we love them. We in Dickinson, of course, love the, uh, love the boat the story because it is in Dickinson. But the, uh, the law part of my background, my, the, the, the you know, how do you, in these very lightly populated areas, how do you get some law and order? And, and to a certain extent, it seems to me that the early stories are always some form of citizen justice, which is a very dangerous thing. Because the formal law hadn't come, and so there had to be grazing associations to police the grass, and there were mining associations throughout the West. And then there were vigilantes because when horse thieves would come through here, there was no 911 call. The nearest marshal was 100 and some miles away or down in the Black Hills. And so eventually you have to take the law into your own hands. And the vigilance committee was sort of a, mm -hmm. as you know, kind of a middle ground between no law and real law. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, in, a, in a sense, you can, you can, you know, we all, we all that the famous, you know, sense. This declaration was no come to it. Yeah. In a sense, you can you can sort of you can. I'm a lawyer, you know, so I come at these things from that approach. But you can kind of you can kind of mark in the West the transition from pure frontier to civilization when you have an existing 
truly legal structure with sheriffs and juries and courthouses and all those sorts of things. After the boat thieves incident, so we, the thieves steal his boat, he tracks them down, makes a boat, and brings them over um, from the Kildare Mountains to Dickinson, turns them, gets a $50 reward, goes to see this doctor, Victor Hugo Stickney, who sort of patches up his feet, and then Roosevelt had to leave right away on a freight train because he had a meeting of the grazing association out here. And the grazing association was sort of frontier democracy. And so that you can see how the law is kind of generating here. Billings County was going to be formed, but there was a lot of resistance to that because that would be taxes and regulations. And so that kind of don't tread on me mentality was out here. But Roosevelt was always a law and order man. And, and, and yet it's still very lightly. I wonder how many jury trials, if any, there have ever been in the history of Billings County. That'd be, that'd be an interesting thing to find out. I don't know the answer to that question. It's not a very high number. It's probably not zero. But it's probably been not several very in high. my lifetime, but they wind up being adjudicated in Dickinson. There's a county here, it's one of the least populated counties in North Dakota. It's pretty wealthy because of oil revenues, but most of all that legal work that I've put for 35 miles used to Dickinson. We have a statue on the courthouse lawn at Dickinson, the Stark County Courthouse, with the Roosevelt Center Commission, and it's of the 4th of July speech that Roosevelt gave in 1886, because after the vote was instituted, It's not just that there's a university 35 miles away. You're saying that there's actual Roosevelt. There, is, there really is. And, 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 and that's a, it's another site that people that like theater Roosevelt should see. The, uh, the statue there by a John by a state. Uh, is a fun statue because it shows what. And I think that's it's another reason to come out here sometime is that. And that's a quick visit, you know, that that uh, that, that courthouse. And, uh, so then, and I'm really glad that that, that, that was done because it, it preserves our. Uh, it, it's really one of those preserving. Reminds me of our of our uh, presentation last night. A different moment in, in in Roosevelt's life, but that moment, that July Fourth speech. You can make an argument that that was a pretty important event in Roosevelt's life. He was his first great national speech. That's one where he said, like all. And, but he also said in that speech, I feel as much a, a one of you, a Westerner, as an Easterner. And he was sort of saying, the West is not just a place where I went out for some adventures. The West is now part of my identity. And as you know, in 1910, uh, coming back after the presidency, he said in Fargo, I would never have been president of the United States had it not been for my time. In you know, we North to go and support absolutely love that, love that <laughs> statement. But you know, uh, I think it's true. Uh, you know, I, I you know the, the, the time in life that he, in his life when he came out here and spent the most time. It was it was really an important time. Well, and, and, and the is, people the people he interacted with. What do you think it was? What happened here that made him the Roosevelt that we think of as the man on Mount Rushmore? Uh, he I don't know. My I've got my own theory. You would know this much theory. better. But my theory is he really did live among. I, I hate the phrase "common people." That's I mean, he let the but he real people, the plain people. Yeah, that was yeah, his people, term. people, and he and he and he learned a way to relate to those folks because the uh, you know he certainly came here with money and, and left with less money, but but came with came with money. But he, he he I just think he really treasured those interactions that in this part of the world to this day we have a little less pretension, you know, we have a little less fanciness and I, I think that was important to him, given his up um, to, to you know take take three trips on the uh, when they were doing the roundup for nobody else was taking one right. one shift and, shifts, yeah, yeah. yeah and I just think that that uh, that connection with this, this was a, and I want to be very careful how I say this we love this guy this was a it's still a tough still place. Tough place. It's still a tough place to live, but uh, but you know he he did it. He, he didn't fake it in his time out here. And I think you know at first there was that apprehension of him that you you know you referred to earlier in today's program with Joe Ferris. You know here's somebody for money, and he's he wants to you know get this check mark on his uh, on his list, and then 
and then they went through all that, uh, all the bad luck on that uh, on that trip. And I, so I really think he wouldn't be president. So you're seeing like the here. birth of the square deal out here, with this commitment to the common person, the person who's not privileged, not wealthy, not from a distinguished family, just a solid American, that he, he mingled with such people. And unlike the Marquis, who wanted to distance himself from the people, Roosevelt jumped right in and he wanted them to like him and he wanted to like them and did. And, that, you know, other events of his life, I mean, the, the collection of the Rough Riders, you know, he gathers up those kinds of people who were always, and, and then and then he'd come back here every once in a while. I, I don't know, I, you know, I'm biased. I, I'm the president of the, of the university that I also attended uh, right here, but... I just really think it's true that this place was really important. You What's would know far better than me. No, you're I think right. it's, uh, we, that's our view too. He, he became a small D Democrat. He was always a Republican Party affiliation. But he really then got this connection to the people with a capital P. And so when he ran on, for the third term in 1912, he lost the nomination and wound up losing the election, although he did get the largest third party vote in American history. But he said, it, the people are for me, and it's true that there was this kind of, he was the most beloved American by almost everyone except the handful that just couldn't abide him. Um, he had that connection, and, and people sensed it, and they, and they knew the authenticity of that. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's, if, you, if you study, if you're interested in politics, another thing that I'm interested in, a whole lot of people make a claim to being, to being of the people. I don't think there was anything artificial about that. I mean, he, he actually, he actually had that. Now, obviously, he had wealth. You know, he came, he came from advantaged circumstances. But he, uh, that's why I think this part of the world was so important. To me. I agree with you. And, and in, in, as you know, it, it didn't have to be North Florida. It could have been Wyoming right. or Colorado, right. but it, it was here. And there's something uniquely magical about these badlands that even the South Dakota badlands don't quite. Well, and the, and the and the other thing that I think, if you like history, and I and I, I I'm not a trained historian. I just love history. I just you know, I, my my dad was always great stopping at places like this in the car, and 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 I love it. Um, one great thing about about Wendy's National Park is, I think that this is closer to what it was in Roosevelt's time than a lot of other historical events. You know, you go to the you go to the East Coast, and there's there's always this fight that's going to go on for decades about preserving civil, you know, places that were really important in the civil war that are being encroached on by, uh, and I don't, I don't, you know, but it's perfectly understandable. We all have houses, we all have land, we want pieces of land. This place feels like it's closer to when it had that national historical significance than a lot of places. That history is pretty recent, 1883 to 1887. It's just 35 miles from your office, just waiting right. for you. It's less visited than Yosemite and Yellowstone, so you kind of get it to yourself in a certain way that you might not if you're in the heart of the summer at, at Yosemite. And there is a kind of a river. You know, the Badlands of South Dakota are an amazing place, but this little Missouri River has kind of its own deep romance, and Roosevelt felt that. It, it, it does a little. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a tiny little river in a lot of ways. Uh, but it was important to him. Part of, part of that little secret project that we're working on, we're trying to incorporate that. But that's we'll just leave it at that. So you did law. Were you a criminal attorney? Uh, I I was actually a prosecutor for a while. So I was U.S. attorney for a while. I'm pretty sure that I met with Wendy's father because I was the U.S. attorney, 1990 to 93, and we came out here and had a meeting with the park rangers. And so I'm pretty sure I met. You're a prosecutor. So did you prosecute murder? Uh, I, uh, homicides. Uh, we should do, uh, you know, we should do a mock <laughs> trial. I, I'm very interested in, in preside. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I actually have done some historic trials, uh, uh, and it, it's really interesting to bring it to bring it back. This is it. This is an interesting result. Now, by the way, it is also not unusual, even though the prosecutor usually wins in our system, if the defendant is well off and a bit of a celebrity, the defendant often. Oh, geez. When does that ever happen? Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just, oh, just, okay. just, just a general thought. Just a general thought. Yeah. So we're going to move on here in a minute, but um, it's an exciting place. And and so Roosevelt wrote about this in kind of an indirect way in, in his first book, uh, Hunting Trips of a Red Fan. 
he said that this this phase of, of open range, no fences, uh, squatting, uh, sort of vigilante law would yield to homesteading, to real deeds on land, and that that was actually a step up. That we this was going to be a step towards greater civilization. But boy, was it fun to be here during this period. Oh, and that that period, as you go across the West, the period where it started to get fenced off. There were, this is not the only As you know from Wyoming. Yeah, right? yeah, it is. The, the Johnson County Cattle War, and, and uh, that's kind of an event that at the different levels repeated itself, as I understand. The, the folks who wanted it to be open range, and then very often the more common folk who were homesteading and were fencing it in. Um, lots of conflict in the American West. And you know, this incident began over cutting fence because the Marquis was a landowner. And he was putting up fences, and at that time, that was heresy out here. He was the wave of the future, but he did it in such a way that he really upset those uh, those original white North. Dakota yeah, and, and, and yes, and and, and, and and even even today, we sometimes have disputes over fences and hunting, and, and we aren't we aren't completely past that. We, we, we still we still think about such things. Well, this is kind of a magic place. The river's right here. Unfortunately, there's a highway here, so you do get a little ambient noise, but. I love it that you can walk out of the town of Medora and walk all the way here and come to this site. Which is, uh, there's a lot of a lot of American history is encapsulated here. Yeah, it's a, if you're staying in downtown Medora, it's a decent uh, but not unbeatable walk. Or on a bicycle. Yeah. So we're off to the next thing. We are. We're heading back up to uh, Wind Canyon in the park. We're going to stay live for a few minutes as we travel, and when we get out of range, uh, the a video will queue up, and that video is about the Elkhorn Ranch because, again, we can't take you there today. It takes a while to get up there. There's no connectivity right um, now. There. And there's no connectivity up there, so we did the pre recorded video of the Elkhorn. Um, but we'll join you back uh, live in about 25 30 minutes. For um, our clothes. Get, and, and so we're, we are going to stay live for a couple more minutes, but then we will have that break and, and the video in between. Wendy, I feel certain you want to say that it's not your national park. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that, 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 oh, you <laughs> get to be the superintendent. That. Yes, it is not my <laughs> national park. I have the privilege of managing it. It is all of generous of the president to say but, but, but it belongs to the and, people and yet it is an amazingly um precious thing for me no so. when, you, when you have a chance to run an in, in institution it yes it's a, people sometimes <laughs> say that about the university of Through a pretty muddy path today. There through was a, a muddy path today, which point is, to we've, point. we've never found it to be so before. Some kind of a gully washer rain came and just, just saturated the ground. Unusual for this time of year, but we made it because you know what? We have the right stuff. We're strenuous. <laughs> and so we are now in a very important spot for Roosevelt. And I'm just going to ask you to tell us about where we are and what people might hear and see at this Place. We're at the Elkhorn <laughs> Ranch, um, which was his primary home in the Badlands of Dakota Territory. He had a house built here. Uh, we're on one of the, the foundation stones. We're in the house now. We're in the west side. Uh, over behind us, ahead of us, is the, is the east front, and beyond that is the Little Missouri River. The river at the time was closer to the house. It, it shifts and moves around in its corridor. And so now it's uh, an eighth of a mile, maybe a little bit less from here, and the grass and trees have grown up in the interim. But in his time, it was right beyond where the house ends, uh, and he has some photographs that he took of it. He was, a, he was a photographer himself, and he took some brownie photographs of the place. But he had this house built. He played a role in the construction of it. It was built out of squared cottonwood logs. And it then became the, the headquarters. And he wrote part of his um, books here. He wrote uh, a tribute to his uh, wife, Alice, here. She was a beautiful 
in face and form and lovelier still in spirit, the sort of Victorian tribute, the only one that he ever wrote to Alice, he wrote here. And he has lots of descriptions of, of what it was like to be here, the books that were in his library. Uh, he talks about the veranda, which faced towards the east, and he had rocking chairs on it. And he said, you know, what American doesn't like a rocking chair? And he said, we'd, at the end of the day, he and his hired men would sit out on the veranda, and each one would take down a book from T.R.'s shelves, and they would then read. And he'd say, in just a few minutes, I'd look over, they would be asleep. He'd say, because they, they had worked hard, and they... <laughs> Their, their interest in reading at this point of the day was less than mine, but he would keep reading. Uh, it was just kind of a sanctuary for him. It was a long, long, long way from anything. It still is. You really have to want to come to this one. And it's easy to get lost. You know, even now, you and I have been here many times. The whole way, we were like, is that the turn? Is that How many turns are there? Because it's, it's remote and it's not well marked. And... I love what the National Park Service has done with it, Sharon, which is to say virtually nothing. Yeah, leave it as it is, preserve it in its current state. Um, ages again. have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. He said <laughs> of the Grand Canyon, but it could be said of, of this in many other places. And so around us we have the foundation stones of the ranch house, which was large. It was not a cabin. 30 by 60, a big house, 1,800 square feet, yes. plus, a, plus a basement, in which he seems to have had a dark room, which is weird, but apparently true. They've done archaeological studies that suggest that he had an actual dark room here. So, among his writings uh, about this place, I think he wrote about the sound of the cottonwoods, which is also something people can probably hear right now as the wind flutters the leaves of the cottonwood trees. And um, what do these cottonwoods mean, and how old are some of these mm -hmm. near us? So Might they have been here when he was? Yes. So you, you know, we'll pan around a little bit, but these cottonwoods were either not here when he was here between 1884 and 1890, or they were very young at the time. So most of the mature trees that would have been here in his time have, have died. There's, a, there's about a 100, 120 year life to a cottonwood. And so it's possible that a few of these trees were here. There are some nearby which were certainly young trees in his time. But the experience is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so you are surrounded here. We're in a, 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 a stretch of the, of the Little Missouri River, and the river isn't fully lined with cottonwoods, but, but there are a lot of them on both sides of the river, especially in these bottoms where there's a lot of uh, moisture. And so when Roosevelt was here, the experience would have been very similar. You can see it in some of the black and white photographs that he took. And, uh, for those who don't have this advantage, we'll go quiet here for just a second, but there is nothing more characteristically North Dakotan than the dance and the sound of the cottonwood trees when the breeze is moving through them. I'd say that we have about an eight mile an hour breeze. Let's just listen to it for a minute. never heard an industrial sound here in the entire time that he was here. Uh, the closest would be the sound of a crosscut saw as he and his men cut the, the cottonwood logs from the, uh, the house site. He did a little of it, not much. These were main woodsmen and they were expert at this sort of thing. But beyond that, you would have heard the sound of horse leather creaking, the neighing and the whinnying and the snorting of horses, maybe the sound of the sound that he ever heard. It was haunting. Uh, the lightning, uh, the sound of the, of the high winds, uh, the sound of the river cracking uh, in the spring when the river ice breaks up. It, 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 it has explosions of the river cracking. All of those sounds would have been ones that he heard. And you can still hear almost all of them today. And of course the sound of the coyote. Um, and then Don't forget the, the wolves. The crickets, you can hear them. It's cricket time. It's, you can hear the crickets all over. I forget about the insects, but the cricket is another very characteristic 
found here. So he came here for a number of reasons. He came to grieve and heal. He came to have his little moment of authentic frontier experience, and you can't do that in town. Um, and even he thought the Maltese Cross, the Chimney View Branch, was just a little too close to the, to the arena for him. He had to be alone. And he came here to think. You know, he was 25, 26, 27 years old. He's just, he's just a kid. I mean, we now know that your brain is not fully formed until you're 25 or so. So he's still in his formation as a human being. And he had been a very sickly child. And he came here to decide what he wanted to do with his life. He, he didn't have to work. He, he didn't have to, to be a reformist or a politician. He could have entered the family business. His father was an import-export man. Uh, Roosevelt could have led a life of complete leisure. And this could have been a tiny little interlude in um, a relatively textbook New York uh, upper class life, but he somehow just got under his skin in a big way and he thought, well, you know, who do I want to be? What do I want to do? What is the meaning of my life? What is the meaning of my life now that the two most important women in it have died? And those reflections, well, his men uh, said that they were worried about him, that that he was too melancholy and that he, he made statements like, I, I don't see any particular reason to go on. The baby will be fine with my sister, Bammy. I, I have no reason to, to live. Um, my life has, has essentially been lived out. And, and Bill Merrifield, who doesn't usually get much credit for being a sensitive person, turned out to be a great mentor. And he said to TR, you're not always going to feel this way. You're not always going to be this low. You, know, you have to give this time. Gonna, you're going to come back, and you should not do anything rash or even think rash thoughts because you're in the grips of this double tragedy. And it turned out that was exactly right. And, you know, Roosevelt, as you say, would have healed probably no matter what because he was Roosevelt, and, and the resilience of the human spirit is it's huge. But, but certainly he credited this place with his understanding of what it was to be an American. And he knew, and this is what I love so much about Roosevelt, he knew that he and his class were not America. They were part of America, but they weren't America. They were wealthy aristocrats living in a great urban metropolis with privileges that most Americans never could have had any access to. And so when he got here and he met very basic people, not very well educated, not very grammatical, not interested in opera or Latin verse. Uh, very basic people. And he realized that there was a dignity and an authenticity and uh, something really strong and vital in these people. And he thought, yeah, if I have to choose, I want to be more like that. I want to bring that into my worldview not turn away from it and simply retreat to the class into which I happen to have been born. And this was not political posturing. This was this was how Roosevelt came to see the world. And a lot of it had to do with this right here, his experience in North Dakota. And so this was first a place where he grieved. Mm. You know, each of us turns at those moments of life to different sources to replenish. You think he might have turned to his family. For him, this became a, a life source, if you will. Did his family find it so? <laughs> no. He did bring some of them. Bammy and uh, his wife, he did. And he brought them here. And eventually, I think he brought a couple of his sons out here. And, and they all sort of understood why it mattered to him, but nobody, especially Edith, really uh, found it quite so compelling. I think she had a rough time. They, they arrived in the door in the middle of the night, uh, then they, it was raining cats and dogs, 
they got in this buckboard and they were going through the river literally 23 times in and out at full gallop so they could get up and down these slopes. Water spraying everywhere. Roosevelt having the time of his life. Everyone filled with mud. She's probably scared to death and she wasn't easily frightened. And they got here and then they're here. You're like, okay, you know, it's the middle of absolute nowhere. And she was a good sport. They went riding. She was a great horseback rider. She was a good sport. She was an ideal wife for someone like Theodore Roosevelt. But it just didn't work for her. It didn't. It was his thing, and she got it that it was his thing. But it wasn't going to be hers. And Bammy, who had a had a physical disability, um, wasn't um, able to enjoy it in full. His sister Corinne was here, and she quote wrestled the calf, so she got into it in kind of a little um, full rodeo that the working men put on here. But no, they, nobody else saw it. And you know, when you ask, you know, what, where do you turn in that moment? Where do you turn in the dark night of the soul? So you turn to family, and Roosevelt had absolute support from his family. You know, if you, of all the historical figures I've ever looked at, I found none whose family regarded him as they did and, and, and almost worshipped him. There was a reverence. There was a, they all uh, sacrificed whatever their needs were to, to, to serve the brother um, and child, T.R., and that's, I think, very unusual. And then, of course, people turn to God, and this is one of the interesting sort of perplexities that we have about mm -hmm. Roosevelt, because he, he's not really a very, um, he's certainly not an outspoken Christian. He, he, he was a nominal Christian. He grew up in the Dutch Reformed Church. He became an Episcopalian, thanks, I think, mostly to Edith. Attended church from sometimes, uh, but he didn't. He doesn't refer to the Christ or or God much. It is he has a largely secular way of seeing, uh, with a kind of a patina of Christianity. We shouldn't judge that. We don't know what his private devotions were, but he doesn't seem to have turned to religion as his solace at that time. There's no documentary evidence of that and so what he turned to to two things he turned to these lonely places and he talks about it you know, there's no more melancholy place than a, a hot still day on the great plains and riding alone on the ridge the cooing of the of the doves and so on he, he turned to place the, the spirit of place and there is definitely spirit of place here. And the second thing was kind of wild, sometimes reckless adventure. He threw himself into the adventurous life. He rode horses that shouldn't have been ridden. He, he would do two or three um, uh, sessions, you know, he would do back to back um, labor during the roundups when everyone else was asleep. And they would ask him if he would do a, a night ride around the cattle. And he'd say, sure. And he would talked about using up five horses in, I think, 48 hours, not, not killing them, but exhausting them, and he stopped stampedes, his horse flipped over in a stampede, he was thrown by a horse, and he broke the, the tip of his shoulder, and there were no doctors to treat that, so he just went on. He did a lot of crazy stuff, and you could say that he almost had a death wish, I don't think that's fair, but he certainly had a risk wish. And he later said, of reflecting upon this period, black care seldom sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. That's, I think, extremely meaningful. Black care seldom sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. And you just get the sense of this hectic, pell-mell life, and almost as if he's kind of outrace gloom, or melancholia, or grief, or self-doubt. So that was his other way of healing. And then, as you know, he went back to New York uh, from time to time to see his child and to publish books and to take care of things, to stay current in the, in the political world, at least to a certain degree. And at his sister's house, he ran into his childhood sweetheart, Edith Carroll. Um, and their love was rekindled, and they were soon secretly engaged. And, in December of 1886 in London, in kind of a quiet, out-of-country um, wedding, they were married, and that became, from a 
emotional stability point of view, that became the making moment of his life. And after that, he was not here as often, and, and he gave up his plans to center more of his life here. I think it's inevitable. You know, so we North Dakotans love Roosevelt, and we cherish that he loved us and that he loved this place. And he did so much for us because he called attention to conservation. And we have the only national park named after a historical individual, Theodore Roosevelt National Park. It embraces the world that he knew out here. Uh, he's, he's indirectly responsible for uh, the Little Missouri National Grasslands, 1.2 million acres that are protected by the U.S. Forest Service, which is one of his prime conservation agencies. You know, he, he, he gave to us the idea that there are things in the American West that are so valuable for one reason or another that they should be set aside and kept from routine human economic activity. And so we're in one of them. It's a 218 little enclave in the middle of the national grasslands. And it's been protected um, because of some conservation ranch purchases and some wise choices by the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, but it's fragile out here. And Roosevelt uh, learned that while he was here, and he became that man, that advocate. And, and we are the direct beneficiaries. It is impossible to imagine the conservation settlement, the conservation package of the American West without Theodore Roosevelt at or near the center of that story. So we're the beneficiaries. But it just wasn't enough for him. He was a a deeply ambitious man. He had a strong philanthropic commitment. His father was a philanthropist. And you know, to those for whom there much has been given, much is expected, was almost a family motto. He was trained from earliest childhood to have a kind of a, a service mentality that you serve humankind if you can. And so this wasn't going to be enough for him. It was great. And it changed him. It transformed him. It formed the Roosevelt that's on Mount Rushmore. Um, but it wasn't a big enough arena for him. And so we used the excuse that he married Edith and she wasn't moving to North Dakota. And we used the excuse that his political life uh, was starting to have a resurgence. But really, um, there were when he came here, there were 39,000 people in the in what's now North Dakota. Um, it was extremely remote, small farms, scattered residents living in, let's just say, very basic conditions with a very um, slender culture because the work was just so hard to get through the winters and water the garden by hand and, and to plow the, the ground with a single plow behind a horse or an oxen. And so he's, this world deepened his appreciation of life, but it couldn't hold him. And, and we should be glad for that. I mean, if he had stayed here, we wouldn't be having this conversation. He went back, and the, what he got here fueled him. It, it particularly fueled his sense that, he, that, that his class should not be allowed to rule the world alone. And it fueled his belief that average human beings have inherent value and need to be cherished and taken care of, especially those that are, can't um, assert their own rights. And, and, uh, and he, he became something much more, I think, than he ever would have been if he hadn't had this experience or one like it in another Western state.
the great little Missouri River. Coming in from Devil's Tower and winding and cutting its way through southwestern North Dakota. The cottonwoods are barely beginning to turn. I'd say they're at about 10% today. They were at about 5% yesterday. These are ash and some elm. And they turn sooner. They're beautiful every year, but this year they're spectacular. It has to do with an early frost and a kind of an arid late summer. I'll just stop here for a moment. Just look at this amazing scene of the river, almost intermittent in places. And this broad bench land here in this oxbow, that's the kind of land that ranchers looked for because it enabled them to graze their cattle there on something like a flat. You can hear the birds to a certain degree behind me. We're going up to the top of that lookout point there. But this is just a place that takes your breath away. Whether Theodore Roosevelt was ever actually here is an interesting question, probably, because it's one of the great views, and it's on the way from Medora to the Elkhorn Ranch. So probably he, he took his horse Manitou up this, this little pyramid and gazed down at the river. He was a romantic. He loved this place. He said it reminded him of the poetry and the sound of Edgar Allan Poe. He it got under his skin in some huge way. And when he came back in 1900, he said, it is here that the romance of my life began. So we, we come here with all of our guests from elsewhere. We're in the park. We make this little climb. I used to do it with the great Shyla Schaefer, the wife of Harold Schaefer, who he was responsible for creating the, the portal town of Medora and the famous Medora musical. He died around the time of the millennium. Shiloh lived on until oh, 2016, I think. And we were dear friends and I would bring her and every year she'd say, I'm too weak, my legs can't make it. And then she would scamper up because she loved it. When she got to the top of this place, she would clap three times, once for Harold's vision, once for all of her kin and the people of North Dakota, and then the final time for her own health and gratitude to God and, of course, her doctors. So you can see this cut bank here. The river carved it. On the right side is the hill. And if there were no river, that hill would just extend like those off in the distance. But the river over time has cut this cut bank and you see all the debris that's fallen out of the hill as the river undercut its structural integrity. And the river will go around and then cuts that bank off in the distance and it just does this all the way out. The river used to shift more in its valley than it tends to do now. But all of this land out here was, was carved by wind and water and ice, and some of it by the Little Missouri. Um, but there are great periods of, of moisture when things happen fast and then prolonged periods of quiet. So here we are now at the top of the group here. So I'll just stop here for the moment. Play. We're hearing the meadowlarks. Yes, late for the meadowlarks. It is. You hear them early in the, in the summer, in the spring. They're the characteristic sound of the Great Plains. When I drive from California or Seattle, I always know I'm home, whether it's Wyoming or Colorado or Montana, when I hear the first meadowlarks. I know you feel that too. And Roosevelt wrote so eloquently about that. He loved the Song of the Lark. Well, the Cather wrote a book called The Song of the Lark. It's just a, it's a characteristic Great Plains sound. Roosevelt, as you know, had a particular ear for birds. 
partly, I suppose, because his eyes were so poor. So from a young age, he really learned to discern birds by the sound. Here's Wendy. Wendy, this is an amazing place. It is an amazing place. How often place. do you find yourself here? How often do I find myself here? Um, Here's the other direction, by the I way. I probably get out here. The summer I've been out here three times. Mostly incognito without a uniform. Ah. It's a gorgeous day, isn't it? A little hint of fire smoke in the There's air. There's some haze and a little, little haze. Little odor. Bison over on the petrified forest trail. Yeah, on the west end of the Way park. The petrified the forest. End. These are cypress from fifty or sixty million years ago. Correct. An amazing, amazing hike. Petrified forest. In the One park. of the best in the country. One of the best. We are the second National Park Service site for petrified wood in terms of quantity. What's the first? Petrified forest? Yes. In Arizona. Mm -hmm. Which is also magnificent. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, so that's another great hike, summer or winter. But you have to go out of the park and come back in from the west side Correct. for that one. Or you yes. can hike overland if you're It's really one of the most popular hikes in the park. And of course, that is designated wilderness on the west side of the river. We have about 30,000 acres of Theodore Roosevelt designated wilderness. It's a small patch of wilderness, but it's a serious small, one. But the largest in North Dakota. Just saying something. So we have a few minutes here, so I want to just do some quick thanks. Uh, first of all, Sharon, uh, thanks for your extraordinary leadership in creating this event today and the, and the symposium. We always just cherish the work that you do, and it's been so much fun for the two of us to go out and, and get the, the pre-recorded pieces and now to be here. On, I know that, that North Dakota just is in your heart right to the core. It is, and this is just something we love to share with people and we hope people felt the magic today as we drove getting to see if you were able to see us on the little strip of, of tiles of the participants we were you know transmitting what we saw as we drove we had bison uh, prairie dogs um, so all the wildlife and and we were hearing right here we're hearing those metal arcs and other birds um, it's it's just a a peaceful amazing experience and it has been a real joy to prepare for this and we hope that everyone has enjoyed it as much as we have and i hope it's a menu for people to come back next year when yes. we presumably will be live yes. and we can bring people to some of these negative places i want to thank eric who's of our staff eric put together this extraordinary uh, video this morning he edited it himself he's done a lot of the legwork to make this possible camera work then out on the on the pre-recorded tours with us and i think you've seen some parts of the of the little missouri valley that you hadn't seen before a few it was a lot of fun to work on the video it was, it was, uh, i'm glad i was able to, to help out and make this virtual symposium a success <laughs> thank you and, and in three sentences tell us what you do on a day-to-day -day basis for the tr center oh it varies every day uh the basic part of my job is just uh looking at those materials that we have in our collection uh trying to describe them and then helping them get published so that uh, people like you, researchers, scholars, the, the general public can help find those and learn more about Roosevelt. Thank you. Kelly, you have been a big part of this. Tell us what you do for the center. Um, pretty much the same thing as Eric. <laughs> um, making sure the materials are accessible, making sure the data is as clean as can be so that it's as easy as possible for you to find what you're looking for. And you, you were with us on the recon yesterday. You saw some things you had never seen before, too. I did, yeah. Um, we had some buffalo really up close to the car, which was a thrill. <laughs> and we saw some the badlands south of Medora, which did, are yes. less often visited. Yeah, Chimney Butte, uh, Maltese Cross site. It was great, so thank you. And Mr. President, I know you're very busy. You've got a football game you have to go to. I think Dickinson State versus Mayville State. But you're here. We'll catch that. Yeah, and, and it, it's it's fun to be here. My uh, my wife and I were among those who felt cabin fever and came out here in the spring uh, when Little Missouri is a lot bigger, you know. And and it was it was fun to see it then. It's also a gorgeous time to see it now. Uh, if I can, can I? I'd like to add uh, add our thanks to uh, to Wendy and the National Park Service for helping us out. Uh, also to uh, uh, 
the city of Dickinson, which was a, a major financial sponsor and Prairie Public. Uh, all, uh, all of those made this possible. And again, if I could, I want to thank all of our speakers and just as importantly as our speaker, everyone else that came in and participated in the discussions over the last few days. Uh, we were wondering how this would come off and, and, and we, think it went, we think it went pretty well. And uh, uh, Sharon made it, lots of people make it happen, but Sharon does, uh, she's one of those people that does so much that people don't notice. Uh, and, uh, you know, we threw the curveball that we'd have to go this route and I think she did an amazing job with it. Absolutely. Well, thanks to Patricia O'Toole, of course, for our keynote. Uh, and for Deborah and for Matt for those extraordinary talks last night and to all the questions that came in from all over and everyone who facilitated that. And of course, thanks too to Anthony Willer, who's been our uh, tech guy who has handled this so wonderfully and all of the staff uh, at Dickinson State. You've got a, a, a great team that, that really pulls together in events like this So and, and others. Yeah, the, uh, we also want to uh, mentioned Karen Sieber, who's also on our staff, yes. uh, and she has been adding in the chat today a lot of the links to items in the digital library. That will be archived with the video and I think will be accessible to you. If not, we will package it with it when, you, when we send you the links afterwards so that you could follow up on that and do some research in the digital library if you'd like to on any of the topics that we talked about today. So thanks to Karen for sharing those. So now what I'd like to do, if it's all right with you, is I'm just going to sit here and can we just drink in the Badlands in silence for a few minutes and then we'll say goodbye? Yes, and if, if at, during that time, if people have last comments or things they'd like to share in the chat, we would welcome So here it is, folks. Sitting in a somewhat precarious position here. This is the, the view to the west-northwest. Little Missouri making its way now to the Elkhorn site, which is 20 five miles north of here and then on to the north unit. And then it makes a right turn and goes along the <laughs> Fort Berthold Indian Reservation boundary until it mingles with the Great Missouri River near Twin Buttes and Halliday, North Dakota. Unfortunately, that great confluence has been inundated by the waters of Lake Sakakawea. Here's the view to the west-southwest. Oh, so Medora would be upriver by about uh, 10 miles from here. And now I'm just going to go silent and just pan a little bit for you to just drink in what I regard as uh, my own soul's favorite place in the world. And certainly um, we all uh, take our cues from Theodore Roosevelt who wrote about this, this part of the world more beautifully than I think any other writer who's ever attempted to describe the badlands of North Dakota. So let's take two minutes to um, just silence. You'll hear the little wind and maybe some people from Lewis walking by. On behalf of President Stephen Easton and my great friend Sharon Kilzer and all of the staff, 
and faculty and students at Dickinson State University. Uh, thanks to the TRA and all of our friends around the nation and around the world, we thank you uh, for joining us, you know, at a time when uh, the United States is involved in at least four crises, the pandemic, uh, which nobody could have uh, predicted its disruptiveness, the economic uh, downturn, which may be the worst since the Great Depression, the constitutional crisis that we're descending into, uh, and the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, the, the search for racial justice, and for the unfinished business of the American dream. With all that, we get weary and um, we feel oppressed and, and the current events sort of have, have consumed the year 2020. But it's important to remember that there are places like this uh, that feed your soul, that provide solace. Um, and there is so much that is right about America, so profoundly much that is right and good in the American people and in the American spirit that it's important for us to concentrate uh, our attention on that from time to time. So. As Theodore Roosevelt said, ours is the glory of work and the joy of living. We'll see you all next year, live, we hope, and in person for the 16th annual Theodore Roosevelt Public Humanities Symposium at Dickinson State University, the home of the extraordinary Theodore Roosevelt Center, digitizing all of the papers of the 26th President of the United States. Goodbye, everyone. Farewell. We're glad you joined us.